to our last presenter of the day, which is uh, Jonathan uh, Moreno, uh, Professor of Medical Ethics and Health Policy from Pennsylvania University. Jonathan, are you with us? Yeah, that's very good. You should now be able to share your desktop also if you have any uh, slides you would like to share with us. Yeah, I thought about that, but I think I won't confuse myself. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is, I have a long list of things I intended to say before the session started, and since I'm the follow-up speaker, now of course this list is completely confused, so I can show you my, my slide here. <laughs> Uh, it's actually better organized than I usually am. So, uh, first, uh, I'll sign on to uh, what uh, Mike said about uh, dual use, and in particular to what uh, Nick Rose just said about um, avoiding the tendency that some of us might have to suppose that uh, that all military uses are malign. Uh, that surely cannot be true. Um, I also want to emphasize what I think others have said uh, in effect, that um, you can't get your arms around neuroscience as a whole for these kinds of problems. Uh, they are going to have to be taken uh, case by case, and sometimes, uh, sometimes case by case means technology by technology, and, and it might also mean application by application, uh, which makes everything much more difficult. Uh, DARPA was mentioned. I hadn't took, really intended to say much about DARPA, but it looks like Nick is going to ask me something about DARPA. I don't pretend to have any great insight into DARPA, uh, except to say that um, we ought not to exaggerate their roles to, to such an extent that we minimize the role of other, in, other agencies. Uh, so DARPA has uh, a $3 billion budget. Actually, its budget is always under fire from Congress, although this may seem counterintuitive, uh, because co Congress... Uh, doesn't want DARPA to be doing such speculative things. DARPA sees itself as uh, as looking over the horizon, uh, and uh, Congress often wants them to come up with a better uh, weapon system that can be applied now. So, uh, interestingly enough, they see themselves in a kind of defensive position with respect to their funding. Um, also, other agencies like the Defense Intelligence Agency, and this this is signing on to something that was said about. Uh, the history of the use of the lathe are also important in this respect because they're they're interested in uh, in denial of of assets to other uh, states or to non-state actors, and that includes uh, very much so uh, uh, neuro, neurotechnology. So, you know, some of you know, in, in 2008, uh, I sat on a panel for the National Research Council that was sponsored by the DIA uh, and the uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and the, the, the purpose of that uh, project, which was uh, wholly unclassified, uh, was uh, to see if uh, it could be assessed whether other actors, and we particularly were asked, and I helped to write an appendix on Iran and China, uh, what kinds of neurotechnologies they might be interested in, and um, about the only way to, to try to assess that would be to trace the manufacture and export import of some uh, some technologies from uh, certain certain companies, uh, but you can't get somebody in the lab unless you can perfect what the CIA uh, used to used to be interested in, which was uh, remote viewing, uh, taking advantage of ESP uh, to actually project yourself into the lab. I don't think there's much credibility to that uh, anymore. Uh, so um, what I thought I would do though is uh, run down a list of some of the uh, technologies that uh, are in the literature, in the very small literature that a few of us have, uh, on this conference have contributed to about uh, neuroscience, national security, uh, the military, uh, and, and counterintelligence. Um, and I want to say about all of every item on this list, although undoubtedly the US, U.S. Brain Project and the, and the European Human Brain Project are going to push things forward. Every, every item on this list is, uh, has some, a benign or dual use possibility. Uh, its, its applications are speculative, uh, particularly speculative outside the laboratory. Uh, it's not clear whether any of the technologies I'll mention actually solve a problem that couldn't be solved better and cheaper by stuff we already have, uh, at, at least at the moment. Um, uh, and, uh, so maybe I'll just go down this list and, 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 uh, and say a couple of things about, about each of them. 
Uh, Malcolm already mentioned capacitance, so I won't I won't talk about capacitance. But all this this does this is a good example of the question: uh, what counts as a neuroscience uh, or neurotechnology weapon, and what doesn't? Uh, as a, a chemist, biologist, uh, Malcolm is in a better position than I am to talk about this. Uh, but this this fact of kind of convergence of disciplines and overlap really also makes it hard to know how to do the regulation. Um, so sticking to some of the of the more technological areas that are specifically within the realm of, of neuroscience, uh, one one comes up with technologies like the use of functional MRI for deception detection. Uh, a uh, um, in order to detect deception involving fMRI, of course, you have all of the laboratory limitations of getting baseline readings from a subject and have to be completely still and have to be very cooperative to find out if they're lying about something. Uh, and there's, there are huge reproducibility problems in just about everything I'm going to talk about. There is a re as you know, there's a reproducibility crisis, uh, as it's being called in the, in the uh, neuroscience literature right now. Uh, and certainly all deception detection technologies using neurotechnologies uh, fall under the heading of uh, problems with reproduction, but they're highly limited. Uh, there are some very interesting, uh, speaking of fMRI, there's some very interesting work, by, as many of you know, by people like Jack Gallant at Berkeley uh, trying to reproduce visual imagery. He does a pretty good job of that within some limitations. Still, all the same laboratory conditions are applied, though, very limited. Uh, auditory imagery, also another group at Berkeley, has been uh, reproducing uh, sounds that are heard by people who have open brain surgery. Again, uh, pretty limited, inherently limited. Um, if we go down to the, the, uh, a favorite topic of the philosophers and neuroethicists, cognitive enhancement, um, well, we've pretty much got the same stuff we've had for a long time, uh, mainly modafinil uh, among the drugs, the so-called anti-sleep pill. Uh, some people handle modafinil well, really helps them stay awake and alert. Uh, other people, it doesn't help. Uh, it's not clear that uh, taking that out into the world, it makes a whole lot of difference, and it might have its own dangers. People might rely on it too much. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's something we've had for quite a while, and there's really, it, it seems to be hard, and I'm borrowing here from some observations that some of my neuroscience colleagues have kind of made, it seems to be hard to actually do enhancement as compared to therapy. It looks like you can get somebody up to some physiological norm uh, of function uh, much more easily than you can make them better, over, particularly over an extended period of time. Uh, a good example of the dual use problem uh, that has come up in this session is the use of uh, the, the supposed use of beta blockers uh, as treatment with, along with psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. And some people have raised the question back in the 90s whether you could prophylax uh, combat soldiers against uh, post-traumatic stress disorder by giving them something like a beta blocker. Um, seems to me that that would be a very interesting uh, topic for a seminar on dual use and the ethics of dual use, because on the one hand, obviously, you'd like to be able to prevent soldiers from having PTSD or warfighters from having PTSD. On the other hand, would that only embolden commanders to use, uh, to use warfighters um, more vigorously than they might otherwise do? Among devices, the, the talk about transcranial magnetic stimulation or TDCS, two related but somewhat different uh, technologies. Um, there's a lot of interest in that in the do-it-yourself universe. You can go online and read bloggers who talk about giving themselves a little bit of an electrical pulse uh, to the brain before they do Sudoku or something like that. But um, there's a lot of uh, problems with measuring whether that's really useful or not. Uh, now, it is certainly true that uh, the, uh, a National Research Council report in 2009 called uh, Army Opportunities in Neurotechnology proposed that you could perhaps put something like a, uh, a neurostimulator uh, in a vehicle, uh, maybe a biosensor hooked up soldier, and you could tell whether he or she was getting a little tired and give them a little electrical impulse at a certain moment. Uh, but um, this is an example of a different problem, which is why would you spend all the money to do that when, uh, for, from the U.S. point of view, just coming out of a dozen years of war uh, in deserts, you don't even have tanks and trucks. And why would you spend money putting neurostimulators in those tanks and trucks if you don't even have them? So this goes to a, a question that I, I, I want to emphasize here, that any of these things, to be of interest to a, to a military agency, they have to solve a problem that they get, that I, I think I've said before, 
can't be solved better or cheaper or more reliably by something else. So from the commander's standpoint, from the war planner's standpoint, uh, you know, from the logistician standpoint, what's the why field material, why field something that is necessarily better than anything that's been done before that we have, can understand how to maintain and preserve the field. Another example of kind of overlapping technologies with neuroscience is stem cell biology. Uh, there have been uh, writings that suggested that perhaps you could give uh, human neural stem cells and uh, put them in human beings and uh, give them more capacity, more memory, make them more able to learn. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how you would even begin to look at that without having to get complicated with the politics of stem cells and the regulation around stem cells and human experiments. Maybe we can come back to that. Um, the, another kind of technology that shows the overlap with bioengineering is the idea that some kind of chip could be introduced into the brain, a kind of jack-in technology, maybe uh, maybe a kind of a version of the hippocampus uh, that you could that you could apply. Um, again, I think this is very speculative, and, and, and I, I frankly think that many of us have been talking about this for a dozen years, and I haven't seen uh, any great change at the human level or outside the laboratory yet. Um, if I could just conclude by um, making a, a, some suggestions about the uh, practical regulatory measures that have been uh, um, addressed this morning. And I, there are three things I want to say about this. Uh, the, the general point is that I think first we need to rebuild, to build on the systems we already have. Um, so IRBs, or research, research ethics committees, there's always going to have to be a first human user of these things, whatever it is. Uh, in the U.S., at least, IRBs are not permitted to make policy judgments about whether a particular experiment should be done or not, only on the informed consent and, and, and risk-benefit aspects. I'm not sure what is the case in the rest of the world with respect to REBs. But as long as, um, as, long as you have that kind of limitation on, uh, on research ethics review, uh, then somebody else is going to have to look at the policy questions. Nonetheless, IRBs, REBs are an important first step because there is always going to have to be, so far as I can tell, uh, a human user. The second question is, uh, is what second step could be some kind of new um, agency LC procedures. Uh, last year, I participated in a panel that happened to have been sponsored, interestingly enough, by DARPA for the National Research Council on the, on the question whether uh, new emerging potentially disruptive technologies uh, that any agency, government agency that pursues, that supports, that funds projects in those areas should have some kind of LC process, obviously perhaps on the, on the NHGRI model in the U.S., maybe without so much money, but at least some kind of process. And in fact, the NRC did propose that. Um, the rumor is that DARPA has uh, started that kind of process internally for its uh, brain project uh, programs. But I don't know that that has actually been implemented yet. But some, some, at least for government agencies, some kind of LC process uh, seems to be uh, a no-brainer for for uh, for this for this set of problems. Um, somebody mentioned the fact that the private sector is necessarily covered by what we're talking about. That is a really good point. A presidential candidate in the U.S. Uh, in 2008 uh, named Ron Paul was um, uh, complaining about government intrusion uh, on our data and our privacy by access to our, uh, our personal information. And he was standing in front of a green screen that had, had the, the logo of the sponsor of that uh, debate, which was Google. So uh, how you get your arms around what's going on in the private sector, I think, is a question that needs to be uh, kept in mind. Um, and finally, I'll say, any again, with respect to practical regulation, since there's always a first mover, a first user, there's always an entity that is doing this first, whether it's a government or a a private entity uh, or a non-state actor, um, whoever does it first, certainly if it's a government agency, should have to set out the rules for its use in advance and explain why its use uh, conforms with the rules that it's setting out. We missed this opportunity repeatedly in the nuclear age. Uh, it's apparently been missed in cyber. It's apparently been missed with drones. But uh, in perhaps with neuroscience, there can be uh, a, an effort to uh, figure out a way to make sure that first users uh, have the obligation and are compelled to set up the rules for their use. 
Okay, Jonathan, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I would like to turn uh, the word to our panel. Uh, Nicholas, would you like to go first? Thank you, please. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that, uh, that presentation. Uh, that uh, very deflationary presentation about what's actually happening. Um, the question you asked, do any of these new technologies solve a problem better, cheaper, or more reliably than we already have? And uh, it seemed to me that your answer was no. Um, and yet we're faced with the, the, the situation that um, those who fund research and those who are concerned about research are constantly believing that we are moving into uh, an age of uh, radically new dangers. So how do we, um, how do we resolve that dilemma? Uh, some would say that if we simply say nothing really new and dangerous is happening, uh, you shouldn't worry too much about it, then that's just uh, a, a continuation of a sort of complacency, let the scientists look after it, that we need to guard ourselves against. Uh, I want to go on record as opposed to complacency, Nick. <laughs> Um, clearly, it's, you know, I, I've been very interested in these problems, as you have for a long time. Uh, nonetheless, I, sometimes I do think that we need to turn down the volume. Uh, and so, and I'm suggesting as we, I, I, am, I do think we not, should not be complacent, but I also think we should kind of take a breath. Because if we try to do everything at once, uh, even, even in, in potential areas of activity that are, that are, that are, that are highly unlikely, we might miss uh, the, the, tr the trees that are really out there in front of us. Um, and I think we also have to note that we're not very good at anticipating the implications of technology. Uh, um, as, as you and some other people know, I'm very interested, for example, in the history of hallucinogens in, 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 the, in the 40s and 50s in the national security and intelligence world. And I've been, for a, another, a recent, a new paper, I've been going back to some of that stuff again just in the last few days. Uh, and, and Surely nobody in in the in uh, at Sandoz Pharmaceuticals or at the uh, at the CIA uh, or or at the psychiatry clinics in in places from Prague to London uh, in to Boston in the 1950s anticipated that LSD would become an iconic drug of a counterculture. Uh, so we 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 and, and much of the technology we're talking about, of course, is going to be in, in civilian use in ways that we can't anticipate. So I, I do think that it's important to try to figure out, you know, do a landscape assessment is what I would say next. You know, what are the areas that we should, that are the most plausible, not only in terms of the technology, but also in terms of the support mechanisms that a, uh, that a responsible actor would, 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 would see make a certain technology plausible to actually put out into the field, to deploy. So, you know, for example, any technology that, that involves machinery is going, to, uh, is, is going to have to be supported. There's got to be, there's, there's got to be people in the background who can, you know, as, it, drone, drone pilots, so-called drone pilots, don't act alone. There are dozens and dozens of people behind them. Uh, so let's think in terms of what is the most deployable and, the, and, and also the most technically plausible. And I would say let's identify those items first. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves flying in a lot of different directions. Okay, thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, Karl Heinz, uh, would you like to ask a question? No, thank you. Okay, I have two audience members also uh, who would like to ask a couple of questions. That's unless, Nicholas, you would like to follow up on this? Uh, no, I, I think it's good to, to let the audience uh, contribute because we've only got 10 minutes left. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, and I would think I would like to ask Eduardo. Eduardo, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce that correctly, to ask your question. Okay, uh, I would like to ask about the influence of the drug war and the prohibition of certain substances in limiting uh, neuropsychopharmacological research and how does that relate to dual use issues in neuroscience? Is that directed to me? I mean, I have a, a modest response since it does tie into some things I've been Thinking about um, so the the the, um, the prohibition of, uh, on the use and manufacture of hallucinogens, which started in the mid 1960s, uh, the time where when Sandoz, for example, stopped uh, manufacturing the psilocybin and uh, and making LSD available and, and, and so forth, uh, 
that happened because of political pressure about the worries of, uh, of basically of young people getting hooked on those drugs, uh, not because uh, the intelligence community was using them uh, or experimenting with them, um, which were largely was really not known in the mid-1960s. Um, now we're circling back to a very interesting uh, phenomenon in which there are now entities that have authority to use some of these uh, some of these medications or others uh, versions of ecstasy, for example, or or or, or, or I believe ketamine, uh, with people who uh, have are gravely ill and are depressed. So it's taken what 50 years for the the stigma around some of these drugs to uh, to uh, wear off in the culture to the extent that they can be reconsidered for their potential in therapy. So there's another way that this stuff has a way of spinning off that is so hard to anticipate. Okay, thank you. Um, I also have a question for audience uh, member called Richard. Uh, it's, more, it's not quite a question, it's more a comment. I think one thing which we're really missing in this debate today is what can we do as scientists actually doing research? I see two or three things which are clear. It's absolutely clear that we're not exclusively responsible for dealing with dual use. There's a huge role for governments. It's also true that I think we have a big role for understanding what possi the possibilities are, even if we know that forecasting is very hard, and even if we know there are things going on we don't know about, we still have that responsibility. But in uh, David, Le I, I was very impressed by David Lester's intervention. He talked about making tools. If we're making tools, there's no chance that we can stop our work, and there's no chance that, that people will want to stop it. But we can, I think, influence the applications of that work. And there's a huge history of scientists doing just that, talking with government, talking with civil society about what can be done with their research. I just to mention two things. You have the huge pugwash movement about the use of nuclear, nuclear weapons. You had all the work of the geneticists at the Yasomar Convention when people were starting to talk about genetic inter, uh, engineering. Much more recently, we've, scientists have been key in discussions about uh, gain-of-function research and possible risks of weaponization of this research. So I think what we can do as scientists is make the facts known to the public, but also be active advocates for things and against things. But that's a personal point of view. I'd love to hear what other people in the audience think. I mean, I think that's well taken. And about a dozen years ago, so it's worth noting that there is some moral progress, or at least more, much more awareness in the neuroscience community about this. But a dozen years ago, uh, Nature published a what turned out to be a controversial editorial called The Silence of the Neuroengineers, in which it complained that neuroscientists weren't talking about their role in these questions. Certainly, as, as, as is evident from the conversation today uh, and all the other work that's being done, that is no longer the case. Anyone who would like to uh, comment on that or ask a question? Nicola? Yes. I, I think there definitely has been, uh, has been progress. Um, I mean, Jonathan mentioned uh, whether or not there was a move to get uh, LC work involved in early stage uh, uh, development of potentially disruptive technologies. I mean, it's interesting to note that in Europe and certainly in the UK, all the big research councils who are funding potentially disruptive technologies like synthetic biology insist on having a, a so-called res responsible research and innovation element within it and insist upon those who are being funded sign signing up to responsible research and innovation. That may just be rhetorical in some cases, but it does kind of obligate a certain reflection on what's going on. But I was struck uh, talking to some colleagues about neuroscience training, and this goes back to, to Malcolm's point about neuroscience education, that there's very little social and ethical training for, uh, say, master's level neuroscientists. In fact, there's almost none in most of the, uh, in most of the programs that I've looked at. Uh, and maybe just uh, to try and introduce some of those questions in the early training of people at master's or at doctoral or postdoctoral level, that might seem to me to be at least one way forward so that the questions don't seem completely alien and it doesn't seem as if people just have to answer them on the basis of 
uh, their, their armchair reflections, but can answer them on the basis of some understanding of the history, some of the history that, that Richard mentioned earlier about the Silamar Pugwash scientists for social responsibility. That's just a reflection from me about another way of beginning to uh, to deal with these questions, which yeah. is to enhance the capacity of those people at all levels who are involved in the process in thinking through, debating publicly what the implications might be. And I say publicly because I think it's very important that these debates happen not just in private, but happen in the public and incorporating the public. Okay, yes, thank you very much for this important comment. Do you have any neuroscientists or of HPP people who would or any of the other speakers who would like to comment on this? Could I put a question to Nick? Yes, that's, the floor is open. Just, Nicholas, following up the last point you made about education of neuroscientists and it being largely absent, and linking that through to Richard's very carefully set out points about what scientists can actually do, would it not be possible for us to, if not insist, and at least encourage any neuroscientists who are taking part in this research to make sure that they have the necessary awareness and education to understand that there are social implications and that they do have the responsibility to think about those and to make sure that they can make the facts known and to advocate their positions in civil society? Well, the short answer to that question, Malcolm, is, is absolutely yes. And I, you know, w without wanting to, uh, to be at all complacent about it because it's a difficult task, uh, the Human Brain Project has taken that on. That's the role of us who are involved in, my, in our part of the Human Brain Project uh, with our Foresight Lab, with work on researcher awareness, with work on public engagement and so on, and with an educational program within the Human Brain Project, which is beginning, and it's, it's absolutely not easy to incorporate that when there are busy bench scientists who, in a sense, don't get any reward from, for going on a, a sort of social and ethical training program. Uh, but there are the beginnings of that, and, and indeed this, this very uh, webinar is, pa is part of that. So I think those of us who think this is a good way forward should, uh, should talk more about the best ways of doing it. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, Nick, you mentioned the Foresight Lab. Have you considered a hindsight lab? <laughs> I'm actually serious about that. Take a big technology um, about which there was very little anticipation of its social implications. Uh, take the Internet. Uh, um, what could have been done and when to anticipate the implications of the Internet? I think that would be a very interesting exercise, and you might actually learn some things from that exercise that could be applicable to the foresight challenges. Absolutely. Backsight or backcasting is part of what one does. Unfortunately, backcasting uh, uh, doesn't give you very optimistic lessons for the possibility <laughs> of foresight. So, so I, I would like to uh, actually again, thank you. Uh, actually again, just as, for, as the last question, um, Dave uh, Lester would like to ask a question maybe to finish off. Dave, or to, or comments? Yeah. Um, well, firstly, uh, Nicholas, if you are looking for the um, uh, history of the Internet, uh, I know some people out in Silicon Valley from the summer of love you should be interviewing on that basis. What they anticipated then in 1969, God knows. Um, what I was going to say was that uh, it has struck me that the sensible thing to do is to actually put into the IT uh, tuition materials that I, I'm the um, HBP IT Education Committee member, um, it, it strikes me that a, a short section on the um, ethical implications of the technologies I'm talking to the uh, PhD students about would be not out of place. And I think there are rather more questions rather than solutions, ready-made solutions, but to at least invite uh, the students to contemplate the questions which I, I think otherwise just disappear. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, does anyone have a quick response to this or comment? Okay, otherwise, I would like to... Welcome that comment from 
uh, from Dave and say yes. I think that those of us who are interested in this should definitely talk further in the light of this webinar. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much.